you know, it's funny. I look back and I'm like, wow, 300 properties. I kind of remember being at 27. I mean, the ebb and flow of our business that I have been tracking is that, you know, on general, we will add anywhere from 50 or more properties a year and probably shed 10 to 20 properties a year. So we're always netting 30 properties. This is episode number 6-1 of the Short-Term Mental Success Stories podcast. Are you an investor that's looking to have your home professionally managed? Go to cohostit.com for more information. Welcome back to Short-Term Rental Success Stories. I'm your host, Julian Sage. This is a show where I talk to hosts about their journeys in starting and growing their short-term rental business. My goal is that you'll be able to walk away with practical information that'll help you become a better host and learn how to scale your business. Like any exceptional host, we all strive for five-star reviews. So please go on over to iTunes and let us know what you enjoy as it really helps support the show. If you haven't done so already, go on over to our Facebook group, The Host Nation, to connect with the community. Hey, what is going on, Host Nation? I am super excited to be back again with you this week. So as part of the ongoing theme of what we've been talking about on this show is mostly just about pivoting your businesses. So in some of the previous episodes, like one of them, we had Jack Forbes, who talked about creating a direct booking site, a way for you to be able to expand and grow your uh, network. We also talked with Travers last week about how he pivoted his business to be able to accommodate Uh, mid and long term stays and also offloading properties. We've been having a lot of really good guests coming onto the show and sharing their experiences in different types of aspects of short term, mid term rentals, being able to pivot your business and being able to pivot when things are needed is part of being an entrepreneur is part of what this business is about. My heart goes out to everybody that has been affected that hasn't been able to such as many of the hosts in Florida that have been unable to list their properties. I know firsthand that there's just a lot of fear and there's a lot of disappointment and it almost feels like, you know, you just want to give up and not continue moving forward when things start to get difficult. But I want to remind everybody that there is just so much good in this community. And I hope that if you've been following me and this journey of, you know, my own success story as well, that it's helped to inspire you to keep going. There is light at the end of this tunnel and it's just a matter of time. I hope that during this time, though, that you're looking at some of the other options that are out there and also maybe getting inspired to try new and different things. You know, as the cliche goes, as one door closes, another door opens. And with that, if you're looking at other forms of real estate investing, there's actually this conference that I'm going to be speaking at called Veterans Live. As you may know, I am still an active duty uh, Coast Guard member, and I was actually picked to be a keynote speaker at this online virtual summit. That is all military people that have experience in different aspects of real estate investing. So even though the conference speakers are all either active duty or military people, this real estate event is open to the public and all proceeds will be going towards veteran charities. And all the speakers are donating their time and money to be able to just help people and support these charities. So this conference, we're going to be covering everything in real estate investing. So if you're interested in maybe purchasing real estate, if you're interested in syndications or multifamilies, mobile homes, every aspect of real estate investing is going to be in here and I'm going to be talking on short term rentals. So if you'd like to hear me or if you'd like to hear any of the other real estate investors that have just so much experience, share their knowledge, or if you'd like to help support military charities, this virtual event will be held May 29th. So next Friday, Ticket prices start at $100, but what I've decided to do is that if you purchase a ticket through my referral link, again, I'm I'm not getting any commission or anything off of this, all the proceeds go to charity, but if you decide to purchase a ticket for this event and you send me the receipt, then I will give you access to all of the bonuses in our Airbnb Secrets Revealed book. So part of the bonuses that we have for Airbnb Secrets Revealed, if you decide to get the free ebook, You get to become a lifetime member, which means that you get access to one of our courses. You'll get constant updates for the course every single week because every week we put out a new episode and then we update that course. You also get the audiobook version of our newest book, Airbnb Secrets Revealed. You'll also get another ebook that we have out called The Short Mental Success Secrets, which is the first 50 interviews that I've done on the show. And I've taken all of the success secrets and made it into one ebook. So there's over 500 tips from 50 hosts that I've interviewed on this show. 
And the final bonus that you'll get is access to a training program that I actually did with Shannon Hyde from Guest Ready. That was episode 50, where I interviewed Shannon, who's the global operations manager for Guest Ready, which is the largest property management group in London and one of the top performing in the whole world. So we did a special two hour training with Shannon included in there. So you get access to all of these bonuses. The total price for that, if you were to just purchase everything yourself, would be $39. So for the $100 that you'll be purchasing a ticket, you'll also get about a $40 bonus. And what we've also decided to do is that if you decide to purchase a ticket, you'll be put into a lottery. So everybody that decides to purchase a ticket to this event and at the end of the event, we will select one of the people and that person is going to be getting access to our premium course, the VRM formula, which sells for $2,000. So uh, it's a really, really awesome thing. You know, all of this is just to help support military charities. So if you'd like to be able to purchase your ticket, go to shorttermsage.com backslash veterans live 2020. And again, once you purchase your ticket, just send me an email at shorttermsage at gmail.com, letting me know that you purchased it. And I will give you access to all of your bonuses immediately. And you'll also be put in for the lottery to get access to our premium course, the VRM formula. But with all that being said, though, I want to introduce Tim Touche. Tim is the president and owner of Stay Attaché, a corporate housing company that has over 290 rental units in the D.C. area. When Tim and his wife started in 2001, they placed a $200 text-only classified ad in the Washington Post. Now, back then, it was really challenging to get businesses interested in such a small company, but Tim has been able to grow this company over the past nearly 20 years. And Tim's also seen a lot of the economic downturns, such as 9-11 and the 2008 recession. And now he is also seeing the COVID-19 pandemic. So Tim has a wealth of experience in this very unique niche being corporate rentals. Now, I had no clue what really corporate rentals were and how they operated. And this conversation with Tim opened my eyes to exactly what corporate housing companies do, how they operate. And then we also talk about how some of the other players in the space, such as like Sonder and Lyric, and how they are actually classified as corporate housing and how they kind of fit within that world. This is a really interesting and great episode because Tim talks about what a corporate housing company is how they're able to meet the expectations of both property owners and business clients, and how their businesses have been affected during this time. And a quick disclaimer that Tim is not speaking on behalf of the corporate housing industry. A lot of his thoughts and personal opinions are exactly that, just his own thoughts and personal opinions on the matter. If you'd like my show notes for this episode, go to shorttermsage.com backslash str61. Or if you like my show notes sent directly to your inbox every week, then go to shorttermsage.com backslash show notes. With all that being said, on to this week's conversation. Hey, welcome back, Coast Nation, to another episode of Short Term Mental Success Stories. In this episode, we have the special honor of having a pretty unique uh, first time guest for us. We actually have Tim Touche. Tim is the uh, owner, president of Stay Attaché. Is that correct? how you pronounce it? That's right. Yep. Stay attaché uh, in the D.C. area. He is uh, he's got a corporate housing company where he has over 290 units uh, that are in his portfolio. We're going to be breaking down in this episode uh, talking about, you know, Tim's journey and starting all the way back in 2001 before 9-11 uh, going through now. This is, you know, three types of uh, crisis and uh, how the corporate housing company and how the corporate housing world is re responding and and how they're impacted during this pandemic. As we all know, this episode is coming out during uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So uh, we did want to get someone on from a different uh, sphere of the short term you know, uh, world uh, to talk about that. So, Tim, thank you so much. And uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, letting the host nation know who you are and what inspired you to get into corporate housing. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on here. It's uh, it's one of the topics that I can talk about for hours, which is just generally real estate and rentals. Uh, so I'm excited to be on here and um, talk about this niche of uh, corporate housing. Basically, uh, my wife and I bought two investment properties in early 2001, and one of them was furnished. It was an English basement apartment, and the other one wasn't. And we basically took the the one that was furnished already, um, the person who sold it to us said, hey, you can make more money renting it on 
uh, furnished. And, you know, back then it was maybe about 50 or hundred dollars more. And, it, uh, I, I liked the idea as something different so that we didn't have to compete with all the other rental properties out there. And eventually we, uh, furnished the other one up and decided to focus on that. Um, and this was back when, um, you know, we had classified ads and uh, in the back of the newspaper. And uh, it was uh, quite a, a lift to get um, businesses interested in a really small company. So someone basically just said it'll be, you know, you can actually make a little bit more money if you list it as a furnished. Uh, you know, right now we have the luxury of, you know, uh, lots of people are going online for the Internet. You have all these different sites where you can get this. We have, you know, we brought up uh, before talking about like Airbnb and how you utilize that as well. Uh, but before you were putting classified ads in the newspaper, how, how much how much are you spending to, to try to promote your your listings? Well, the classified ads were really big on Saturday and Sundays and the majority of them were normal rentals. And then in the back of the back of the classifieds, there was another subheading called furnished rentals where there were one or two listings. And if you went more than two lines, uh, that was about $200 just for that, um, line, you know, for those two lines, if you went three lines, it this, you know, went up another hundred dollars or more. So, um, and you know, all you were able to do was just basically give a general overview and a phone number. Um, and then we put our website on it too, but I mean, it was paper. And so, you know, you had to be scrappy and kind of talk to, um, not be afraid to knock on some businesses doors and set flyers out and kind of, you know, do, do it. I, I remember thinking early on, um, if I'm really going to focus on this, niche, it's going to be a lot slower growth than a traditional rental company. But I felt it would be a lot more rewarding because I, the, the clientele of the renters, um, business travelers uh, just appealed to me and, and uh, someone that I, uh, I enjoy doing business with. So you, when you first started into real estate, you, you decided that you wanted to pick a niche. You said, OK, I'm just going to dive into this. And that was your first two properties. You listed these uh, classified ads, you know, uh, in the Washington, Washington post, he said, and were these individual renters that were contacting you? Because you said that there was like two portions. There was a side where it was like regular rentals. And then there was the, the furnished rentals where was the clientele that was contacting you different. Was it like businesses that was speaking with you directly? They were, um, well, I will tell you that campaign wasn't really all that successful being in DC. Um, having a contact at an embassy or two, um, we got lucky um, early on just talking to a couple of them. You know, to answer your question, the people from the classifieds were not traditional business travelers. Um, there were more individuals who were either um, an intern or um, uh, sometimes people relocating with small businesses that didn't have a relocation office uh, helping them out. So. Um, it was, um, it wasn't easy. So you, you were listening on these classified ads, but then you said that you, you found a couple, um, a couple people from an embassy that were able to give you business. Yeah. So, you know, the embassies, uh, were responsive, um, and, um, you know, and that helped us out for a couple more years as we continued to grow and manage, um, other people's properties. And then, um, you know, this little website called Craigslist came out and pretty much decimated um, classifieds and newspaper industry. Um, and I remember when that first came out, we heard about it because we had friends in San Francisco and uh, they were just opening it in D.C. And uh, we were like, wow, this is great. Free classifieds. Does anyone know about it yet? And so um, that really helped us out early on to um, get the word out without having to spend a lot of money on ineffective classified advertising. One of the things about corporate housing is, can you kind of distinguish what the difference is between corporate housing and, uh, you know, for, for our listeners, which are short-term short renters, uh, you know, in our space, you know, we, 
when we think of like corporate housing, we're typically trying to go after like traveling nurses, like traveling nurses are kind of like our bread and butter for longer term stays. But for you, you said like you, you spoke with an embassy and they were providing you clients. Is that what a corporate housing company is, is just direct or what, what is it exactly? Well, I, I think the easiest way when people ask me what corporate housing is, I usually define it as people who aren't paying the rent themselves. And so while that could apply to uh, nightly, weekly rentals, um, you know, shorter term, um, really, we don't deal with vacation renters. Um, people are submitting expense reports and they're staying for 30 days or longer. The Corporate Housing Association, which I'm a member of, um, you know, one of the unofficial separations from regular rentals or, or nightly, weekly rentals is the 30 day uh, minimum term. However, as an industry, and I can't speak on behalf of them, but there's been a lot of discussions about trying to differentiate based on that minimum lease term. And that's not, um, that's not a global definition, but, uh, a lot of, they, they tend to be longer term stays. Um, you know, our average stay is between three and four months. And where, where do you find these types of people that stay three or four months? Cause for us, when we're trying to market, you know, we use channels such as like Airbnb, Verbo. Uh, if we're trying to find like longer term, uh, stays, well, we might go to like a site like Furnish Finders. Uh, but where, you know, you've built up to 290 properties, uh, and you're filling those with, you know, these three to four month long stays. And right now during, you know, this pandemic, a lot of short term rental hosts are like, you know, oh crap, you know, all my business is dead. Uh, you know, everybody's trying to turn to long-term rentals. So where do you, where do you even find these types of t tenants? The quick answer is it's, it's tough because it's really about a relationship. I mean, if you think about business travelers and they're reliant on their employee, um, or their new hire that's relocating and you don't have a good service reputation or you're just kind of a one-off, they're going to be hesitant to, um, work with individuals. I mean, they will. And, um, you know, so, I mean, I, I usually say it's, you know, we've been doing it for so long and, you know, a lot of it is referral and word of mouth and just kind of building it out that way. I mean, I, um, you know, as much as I want to work with, uh, Google and their relocation team, they are so big that they have, um, contracts in place with companies like Oakwood that have corporate housing around the globe um, for them to work with one provider in one market um, doesn't make sense. So we try to target um, mid size, mid size and smaller companies um, and companies that are specific to DC, um, the market that we're in right now. So when you first started, did you know what corporate housing was or what it would eventually, you know, lead to, because what it, what it sounds like is you reach out to these, you reach out to companies and there's some companies like Google where they already have like designated people, uh, designated companies that they work with. So you're, you know, from what it sounds like a corporate housing company is reaching out to the companies that aren't as large or maybe don't already have those pre-established relationships. And you're trying to have you be their go-to for furnished housing. Yeah. I mean, it's, the way I also describe furnished housing is, um, you know, it's a niche. So if you think about hotel stays or nightly rentals, almost anyone can stay in a hotel for a night or two, almost anywhere in the world, you know, and then conversely, if you go unfurnished year long rentals, most people are familiar with renting for yearly terms, either they own a property or they were a renter or they are renting. Um, so those are the two huge buckets, uh, that we sit between. And so when you go 30 days, um, there are fewer people out there who can commit for one month, let alone three or four months to rent a place. Um, you know, I think about myself, like I, I wouldn't be able to do that. Um, and not many of my friends would, um, especially if kids at home, um, you know, you need to be a consultant and even a lot of them will only, um, you know, do three or four nights out and then be back home. So it's a small group. Um, and I, uh, I find it interesting that a lot of the, you know, Airbnb and other providers are saying, Hey, this is a, a new group. And I agree. It's not their typical rental renters, 
but you're also pulling from a much, much smaller pool of potential potential clients. And I mean, I knew that going on or early on where it's like, it's not going to be this company that grows, you know, exponentially because there's this worldwide need for furnished monthly rentals. It's just a, it's a nice niche to have. And my approach has been, you know, let's try to be the best at it, uh, at what we do and, uh, and have fun along the way. So, so what was the turning point for your, your business? You had these two units uh, when you first started, you were listing them on the classifieds. Was it the embassy? Was that, it was like, this is a legit, this is a real business now where we have a reoccurring client or was it something else? I would probably say it was um, Craigslist getting a mass following just because we could then more easily target um, uh, a better variety um, of clients. Um, instead of paying a lot of money for that, it was all free now. And you could include photos and, you know, um, Unfortunately, Craigslist, uh, you know, suffers from what the eBay phenomena of trust and reliability, you know, once it becomes kind of free or easy to put something on there, a lot of bad actors kind of follow suit. So, um, but I would say that was the big catalyst. And then, you know, from there, we were able to kind of um, get in with more companies and get more regular business. Um, that way. So businesses were actually going onto Craigslist, looking at the furnished rentals and contacting you because before they could only use things like the classified ads. Yeah. Or they, I mean, or they didn't even know where to find them or they would be stuck at a, uh, an extended stay hotel outside of the city. Um, you know, their options were really limited in terms of even providing that. And you know, we tried to say, you know, we do corporate housing, unique corporate housing, where we have no two properties are alike. So if you want a basement apartment, you want a, a row house, you want to be in different parts of the city, we have these options for you. I Also, you know, what's slightly different about, I mean, within corporate housing, the majority of providers are um, demand side, uh, meaning they have salespeople out there calling companies saying, um, do you have a need? And they'll say, yeah, I need a two bedroom in November for three months at this price point. What do you have? And then they'll go out, um, talk to apartment communities, um, try to get a rate, talk to furniture rental companies, try to get it rate. And then, um, you know, so they, that's the demand side of the business. Um, we take a supply side. Here's our inventory. We hope it fits your needs. Um, you know, here's a great variety, and um, it's again a, a, another variation on a niche industry of corporate housing. You know, that that's one of the things that um, you know, like I, I look at corporate housing, and I'm just like, you know, I'm kind of shocked, like what you're able to do, like you know, what you've been able to grow to, because like you said, you have that supply and demand for short term rental hosts. You know, we get all of our you know demand through these. Uh, online travel agencies like Airbnb, Verbo Homeaway, but where you're getting your demand is directly from a company. Um, and then you need to get the supply. So growing that. So during this time when Craigslist, you were able to start advertising, all these companies started going onto there, finding your units. Did you just start? How, how did that grow from there? Did you just start finding people that had properties and you would uh, lease them out and then furnish them, or what's what does that relationship work with the uh, owners and the supply? Yeah, I mean, reaching out to owners has always been um, another aspect of it. Whereas, um, you know, you have to educate them on, you know, it needs to be furnished. Okay, what does that mean? Um, are utilities included? Is that or what if the utilities? You know, what if they abuse the utilities and leave the air conditioning on in the, in the winter? And, you know, I mean, for a lot of property owners, um, it wasn't an easy sell. Um, but we primarily started with a lot of property owners who were looking for flexibility and renting their place out. They may be heading out of town for an undetermined amount of time and they didn't know if they're putting their stuff in storage or not. Um, and so we kind of just, targeted them. And then also it's like most real estate, it's location. If they have a great place that everything lined up, but it was just a little outside of the business center of town, um, it wouldn't rent. 
And, you know, sometimes we'd try and sometimes we'd get lucky and sometimes it wouldn't rent. So it's been just a lot of trial and error. And, you know, at the end of the day, we always say uh, vacancy is the common enemy. And so getting high occupancy rates um, and great renters um, is kind of what uh, appeals to most of our owners. Um, you know, we try to keep our occupancy rate around 90%. Are you leasing the property? Because in the short-term rental space, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this thing called uh, rental arbitrage or the master lease model. Is that something you're familiar with? Yeah, I, uh, doing my research, I, I, uh, I just read about it. But I'm familiar with the concept. It's what a lot of um, corporate housing companies have done in the past um, with big apartment communities. It's called, in 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 our in our industry. It's called master leasing. Master leasing, okay. So so the so with the master lease model, um, are you essentially master leasing from owners, or are the owners taking a profit, or how how does that relationship work with your supply? So our model is based on a traditional property management model. So what that means is we don't let owners self manage a property. Um, and we do that for consistency of service across, you know, I, I always say one of our biggest challenges is to find a, a consistent guest experience across all 300 properties when no two properties are alike. So one way we handle that is by just making sure we are um, on the service side of, you know, the inspections, uh, the repairs, maintenance requests, the arrivals, the departures, the cleaning coordination. All that is handled through us. And um, the other question, I, I got off topic there. What was the other question? I forgot. No, that, 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 that was right. I, I, was, I was just asking about with your owners, are they like personally, like if you don't find a client to stay in their property, are they not able to cover their mortgage payments? Or is that something that you guys cover? Um, just, just trying to clarify on that. Oh, I see. Yeah, we we don't um, we don't guarantee rent. But but if you're not able to supply someone in their property, then they're not able to receive the the money for their payment. That's correct. Yeah. So we just take a percentage of the rent when it's rented. So like I said, occupancy is the common enemy. So if uh, if a property doesn't get rented, the owner doesn't get paid, and we don't get paid. So we do everything in our power to pick up strategic properties that we think can rent well at a number the owners are happy with and uh we share in the risk i mean that that that's that's got to be that's got to be kind of like scary for an owner uh you know having to because they could they could do a traditional rental or a traditional property management company right yeah so what what's yep. the difference from working with a traditional property management where that maybe they're a little bit more guaranteed like they, they're always going to have someone that's in there long term versus working with a corporate housing company where you know, if you're not able to supply, then they're not able to cover their their payment. Correct. I mean, you know, one of the first questions we ask property owners is, you know, hey, what are you, what's your agenda? What are you hoping to accomplish? And if they want more security, we encourage them to go unfurnished for a year. If they want higher risk, um, um, they sometimes have the option to do nightly or weekly rental um, and then, you know, we're somewhere in between. So we do is we roll out kind of what the market rates are. We try to set realistic expectations and based on their um, wants, needs and agenda, you know, sometimes we're a good fit. Um, frequently, we're not. Um, so that's why, you know, this niche is, is what it is. Um, you, you know, when we talk to people, sometimes they care more about... Um, higher quality renters than getting the highest amount rent possible. Sometimes they carry more about flexibility, you know, so the, those are, you know, sometimes we have people who have like really big houses and they don't want it to become a group house. And so, you know, I mean, while we can't technically prevent that, we do have um, fewer requests for uh, large houses and, um, you know, so that that makes our option appealing. So when you're trying to pitch a, a property owner and, uh, you know, tell them about the idea of corporate housing is what's, uh, you know, you're, you're giving them this, this unique value proposition that they could find a better quality tenant. But are you also doing things like 
Are they because of the risk that maybe they're taking on trusting you? Are you offering them a higher rental payment or is it just the standard rental rate? Um, and this is just the, bo- the the benefits that you get if you if they do decide to work with you. Yeah, I usually like saying, I wish we were always the highest and best use of real estate. And as a niche, we're not. Um, there are certain factors that will determine, um, you know, if we can get a premium over a normal unfurnished year long rental, factoring in the potential vacancy, factoring the utilities, factoring in the furniture. Um, and sometimes we're not. Sometimes people will say, Oh, that's all I can get. Well, I can get that. Yeah, unfurnished. And I would say, then do that. Um, but like I said, sometimes there are other factors, the convenience, the flexibility, they want, um, better, they want better terms. And, um, so that's why, um, they choose to go with us. So you, you have, you have a owner that's willing to work with you and now you have this new property, but now you go back to, the demand you have to have the people that are going to fill the property. Are you going back to the same people that you previously were working with and asking them for more if they need more housing or do you have to find new people? Uh, like how does that balance work between that supply and demand as you, as you're growing? Um, yeah, I mean, we will highlight new properties that we get. We'll talk to our existing clients and say, Hey, um, here's a new property or two. Um, you know, or you stayed with us uh, last year and the property you stayed in is now rented or it's not available during your dates, but here's one that's similar um, in location or style or size or features and, um, you know, offer it to them that way. You know, during this time when Craigslist was was allowing you to grow your business, uh, you, you, were, you were scaling. What, what did, that, did that look like? Were you, were you just saying you know, now's the time to really scale this up. And is that when the majority came or when was kind of like the next pivotal moment after Craigslist for your, for your business? I don't know. You know, it's funny. I look back and I'm like, wow, we're 300 properties. I, I kind of remember being at 27. Um, I, it, there wasn't, I mean, the ebb and flow of our business that I have been tracking is that, you know, on general, we will add anywhere from 50 or more properties a year and probably shed 10 to 20 properties a year. So we're always netting, at least in the last couple of years, we've been netting around um, 30 properties. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of part of the, the deal where we have some owners who will say, hey, I want to rent it and then I need to wait for a year or so and then i'm going to sell it and so having our option is a great option for them um to do that so we know going in that we're getting a handful of properties that we may not have more than a year and then other times people will take jobs overseas and then it didn't work out and so they're like i gotta move back in and so then we work with them on you know giving their property back and other properties um you know, is there are market changes and conditions and, you know, the vacancy is uh, greater than they expected. And so they, they do something else with it. But I usually say, I go, if we aren't able to do what we say we're going to do, we wouldn't be growing every year. And, and we pretty much have been, I would say the last year or two has been tough. Um, but, you know, in general, we're still um, adding properties and keeping places rented. So as you're adding these properties, are you also focused on uh, finding new clientele, like finding new businesses that need a constant flow of corp- uh, furnished housing? Like, how does that work? Yeah, I, I would say the majority of our marketing efforts are always about developing and fostering relationships with the business clients we have and finding new ones. You know, to a lesser degree, it's finding property owners because, as I said before, a lot of property owners. It, may not make sense to them. So for us to go out and try to convince them that this is what they need to do with their property um, doesn't always uh, resonate. Um, And so really we're always focused on keeping the inventory we have occupied as close to 100% as possible. You keep occupancy for your properties around 100% you said? No. 
Uh, I mean, so in certain neighborhoods, we average around 90 to 92 percent occupied. And then, you know, citywide, it's probably around 85. Wow. And see, that that's the crazy thing to me, too, though, is that because you have these clients that are staying for like three or four months, I, you know, if someone takes a block of your calendar um, and now you have maybe like this wedge where it's maybe, you know, inconvenient for most. Now you have to find a client from one of the businesses that you work with to be basically pair them with that little gap in your calendar. Yep. And, and you, you've been able to stay around 90, 80% occupied in, in your units with, with that. Yeah. And I mean, keep in mind our price points are lower than, um, you know, in, and, and this is a broad generalization, but the way I describe it is we are going to be, um, 30 to 40% more expensive than unfurnished year long leases, but there's flexible terms, utilities are included and there's furniture involved. And then we're going to be 30 to 40% less expensive than nightly and some weekly rentals. And so, you know, when I talk to owners on both sides, they're like, you know, if you have a, a three bedroom, four bedroom house that you're doing nightly rentals for in the high season, you know, you, People are getting four or five, six hundred dollars a night, and we can't come close to that. You know, so we know that going in, and uh, if people want to do that, and they're okay with, you know, the quasi legality of of it, you know, I, we don't, we're not here to convince you otherwise because the numbers just don't always work out. So, so y- y- you said you spent the majority of your marketing efforts on fostering those relationships with. Uh, businesses, um, what what does that relationship building look like, uh, and what does your marketing? Yeah, what does your marketing efforts look like when you're trying to create a relationship with a business to provide you uh, these these clients? Well, I mean, it's it's basically you know our efforts are like, hey, you know, we have roughly 300 properties in this part of town, and we have you know this variety, and um, you know, visit our website. And, you know, hopefully, you know, we'd be happy to meet with you and discuss, um, you know, how we can help, you know, we'll, we'll reach out and show them new inventory that we have and, you know, just kind of find out what they're looking for. And it's, I mean, I, I, I can't say it's much more complicated than that, but it's also kind of knowing not everyone's your customer, not everyone's going to want what you have. And, um, and still kind of, you know, pushing on and finding the folks that, that do resonate with what you're offering. Well, that, that's, that's going to be my next question is, is that how do you know who's the, who's the right person? Cause there's plenty of businesses out there, but how do you know which businesses are the ones that can fill your units? They're either the ones who respond or, um, you know, we, we ask are, is this what you're looking for? So, um, I mean, it's, you know, sometimes it's surprising because you don't think um, a bigger company um, would have a need for this. And then, you know, there may be their current provider can't supply um, something. I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, larger companies that use um, national or global corporate housing providers don't always have... Um, houses in their inventory, like freestanding houses, because they usually like the model of um, large apartment buildings. Um, and um, so if they have a client that has a need for uh, a row house or a freestanding house, um, we work with them and kind of just say, hey, give us a shot um, when those requests come in. Um, so, you know, it's just kind of understanding our our value position and talking to the people who have a need that they don't, who have a need that they don't currently have in their inventory. But for, for like even finding these businesses, cause like there's, there's sites out there like, um, corporate housing by owner. And I think it's just what, it's just like a listing site and, you know, companies like, you know, like even, even my properties, like I could list my properties on corporate housing by owner. You probably use that to market yours, I imagine, or you, you stay away from sites like those. Uh, we used to, um, w- when owners contact us, uh, for their properties in areas that we don't service. I mean, for example, like Tyson's Corner, which, um, gets a lot of business travelers. Uh, but for us to manage it effectively, we'd be stuck in traffic. Uh, we'd almost have to open a, an office out there to do that. So, 
we would uh, we we send them to corporate housing by owner as an option. And th- that's like individual companies or individual people that contact you asking for for a unit. You, you'll just send them to a site like that. No, sorry for property owners property who contact owners. us. Got it. And they say, hey, can you help bring corporate renters? to the property that I own. And if it's not in our um, area, um, I'll direct them to list it on corporatehousingbyowner.com. Got it. But for like how you're even finding these, these businesses, are you, is there like a list of businesses that like you um, you're getting from somewhere from somewhere else? Like, like you said, the, the national corporate housing association, or is this like you're going out on the internet and just, finding businesses that are there and seeing if they need, um, need rentals in your, your area? I mean, our, our approach is kind of all of the above. Um, I mean, as a member of Corporate Housing Friars Association, you know, they have webinars and annual conferences that they go to every year. And, uh, you know, and it's just talking with other providers and finding out, you know, <laughs> That's when I, I get to spend the most of my time talking to large corporate housing providers um, and just kind of, I'm always there saying, do you have a need in DC that, you know, needs a house? Um, we've got several. And just kind of giving, you know, getting access um, to them at, at that opportunity. I, I would say that'd be hard to do just on a phone call randomly. So like at the networking events, those are, those are great conversations. So within the corporate housing world, you guys work with other companies and if they... Other corporate housing companies, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And if they're not able to service, like if one of their clients says, oh, we need properties in the DC area, they'll refer you business and yep. and, and you get like, uh, is that like a commission or a split? Like, how does that work? You know, it's, it varies. Sometimes it's um, you pay a referral fee. Sometimes... Um, they'll mark it up a little bit. Um, Other times they'll just say, Hey, this is a really valuable client, you know, treat them well. And there, there's no money um, involved, Um, you know, and it's a good community because it's, um, it's a small, uh, I mean, it's a niche again, I, I say that again, but it's, it's big, but compared to hotels and compared to vacation rentals, um, you know, it's, it's, it has a community feel. It's kind of weird. So, so let's say for the people that are uh, interested in starting a corporate housing company, um, you, you said, you know, there, there's people that well, they'll, they'll try to reach out to Google and say, Hey, you know, are you looking for corporate housing? But they already have a provider. So for the, a new person that's coming in, how do they even know like where to start or like how to even grow a business if everybody else is already has those established relationships? I mean, I would say if you just have one or two, you're probably just better off going on the internet. Um, I mean, reaching out to businesses, you really have to have something that would be appealing to them. And you probably want a decent number of units um, um, that you can fulfill their needs for. So, um, I mean, to people who have been doing short-term rentals and because of the coronavirus have a lot of vacancy i you know you could say hey you know target go online and try to find a bunch of different businesses but i mean you know even traditional businesses that are do business travel have travel shut down right now so that's why everyone's talking about nurses and doctors and i mean that's a smart thing to do because in this restricted age you know, that's kind of uh, really the only people out there that are traveling and are looking for temporary accommodations. You know, going, going off of that, how, how has the corporate housing world been affected by uh, this pandemic? I mean, you've been through, you know, three, uh, you know, major economic downturns, you know, 9-11, uh, 2008, and now uh, with the uh, corona, I'm sure that you could probably find some others in between there, but you've, you've, You've seen the gambit. Um, how how are corporate housing companies affected during these types of uh, events? From what I've been able to gather, um, I mean, for you know, we're in DC, so I know DC pretty well. Corporate housing providers in other markets 
um, uh, have had some significant losses in terms of um, uh, clients canceling. Um, DC has been pretty good because um, of the number of hospitals here and um, and some government travel is still um, taking place. I had my CFO pull numbers of first quarter 2019 and first quarter 2020, which obviously went through the end of March. And we were down about seven and a half percent. Um, so it's not terrible. We should, you know, I mean, everyone has higher projections. No one project is, projects to go lower. Um, but our cancellations have been minimal to whereas I have a, I have a friend of mine who has a 10 unit building um, in DuPont Circle uh, and it's zoned to do nightly. Um, and he, you know, he was at, you know, he, for the first two weeks when this came out, he was like, I'm at a hundred percent vacancy. Um, you know, he had, everyone was canceling on him. And, um, and, you know, fortunately we haven't seen that extreme level of cancellations. And, um, but, you know, I would say it's, that's DC. There are companies in other markets that are, I, again, I would say in general, they're faring better than nightly, weekly rentals because uh, vacation travel has been really put, you know, uh, on hold. And so if that's who you're targeting, um, it's going to be tough. What What has been the most challenging part of of scaling this business, this uh, corporate housing business? It's um, creating a consistent guest experience um, across all the, you know, no two properties are alike where, you know, we've got a studio basement apartment and we've got a four bedroom row house in Georgetown and, you know, coffee makers and supplies and everything is different. And so, you know, managing expectations, getting the experience down well, um, and um, and just being really um, good about customer service. It's just being out in front of everything, predicting, and you know, getting good processes in place. Um, I mean, our it's funny, once we hit a certain level where we had one person handling all reservations um, and that got to be too much for her, even splitting that role into two people uh, became a challenge because, you know, communication breaks off if you're talking to one person and you're talking to another and then it's like, where do we track that? It used to be in someone's inbox and now you have to have a, another program to share um, what was said. And... Um, and then, you know, someone goes on vacation and, you know, being able to make sure there's a consistency of service from, from that level. Um, and so taking the company from where everyone was handling their own little world to having kind of the next level of managers that then oversaw each department. But I think, you know, you talk to any person who owns a business, making that transition is, is tough. So it's, it's, we felt it too. And what are you doing to be able to set your units apart? Because you, you put an emphasis on keeping that, um, you know, that similar experience, you know, your brand throughout all of your units and making it be the same, even as you've been able to, even as you've been scaling your team and scaling your units, what, what are you doing to be able to set your units apart from all the other people that are offering uh, furnished accommodations? I mean, I think the exclusivity of our units where um, you can't, you know, it's a double-edged sword where, you know, most corporate housing providers will have, you know, for example, 2400M is a big apartment building in, in DC and uh, a corporate housing provider in um, Texas, California, and Seattle will list a unit there on their website um, because that building has a bunch of month-to-month um, um, -month rentals in it. And so, you know, and then the furniture packages are different, but really, you know, we have kind of one of a kind properties. And if that's what clients want, then we're a good fit for them. Um, if we have clients who want, um, doorman buildings and lots of services, um, because of our model, our units, um, like those are in condo buildings and those condo buildings have six months minimums. So, 
um, we have them, but they have to commit for six months. And um, so other, otherwise, we usually just, um, we, we don't get the, those business. So, I mean, it's, you know, we, we try to target business around what we specialize in, which are good locations, unique properties, and, you know, reliable and consistent service. And um, you have those, you'll, you'll have, um, I think, a pretty good business. And you you said that your clients will say like your clients will have maybe situations where they need a six month rental. Does that mean that you're going to go out and find a rental that can accommodate uh, six months? Uh, because you said that there's like specific locations where that's the minimum. Um, are you growing your portfolio as your clients needs grow? Yeah, I mean, we're adjusting. I mean, it's, I will tell you, it's been good. It's been harder. The trend the last couple of years have been for businesses even though they say I'm going to be here six, nine, 12 months, my company is only letting me sign on for three months. And so um, as that has become more of a standard, um, we've lost some of our six month minimum buildings um, just because they're, they're not able to rent as well. Um, so, you know, I mean, there's nothing we can do about that um, because those are the the bylaws, but, you know, we, we kind of try to adjust to market trends. I mean, the other um, big trend is just, you know, I mean, people like new, people like really nice places. And, you know, for us to talk to a property owner who had a, we've had a property for eight years or more, um, it needs a refresh. And sometimes those are hard conversations to have with them because they're like, what do you mean? It's rented so well. Why? you know, is the market not good anymore? And you're like, no, the market's good. Your property needs, you know, an update. And, um, you know, so it's always kind of balancing that out and um, um, paying attention to supply and demand and market trends. How does that impact your, I mean, I'm, if your clients are growing and they're, they're asking for more units and you're trying to scale along with them, what happens when you lose a client? Do you have, is there any experience or any time that you lost maybe a clientele or something happened and um, you know maybe it scared you or put you in a situation that you, you didn't think that you'd be able to come out of? Yeah, I mean, every day is a little bit scary, right? I mean, I, I, I mean like we lose, um, I mean, we, we lose property owners because they sell or move or um, we lose um, businesses because guess what, we messed up. And I mean, you know, you see these perfect storms about, you know, oh, well, the keys should have been there and they weren't. And then um, then the air conditioning doesn't work. And oh, by the way, the oven went out on day number two. And, you know, I mean, these things do happen. And it's, you know, on one side, it's almost comical because it's like you couldn't even plan for these, what I call perfect storm of, you know, just series of bad things that started with one small mistake, but then and you try to recover. I mean, I, I think we're good at admitting when we're at fault and we're good at, um, you know, learning from it and thanking people for their negative feedback because um, a lot of times when people are upset, they just kind of go away and you never hear from them again. And so I, I kind of relish um, hearing bad things. Um, I mean, there's a I'm sure anyone can Google, uh, you know, the phrase like hug your haters and I, it, you have to take that to heart. I mean, it, it's painful to read, but then if you really see what they're trying to tell you, it's that, you know, Hey, this didn't work and they're giving you an opportunity to fix it. And, you know, if you just say, Oh, that hurts, but don't do anything about it, then really it's on you. But the gift that they're giving you about an opportunity to make it better, um, gives you an opportunity to act on it and and fix it what, how do you see the this um this master lease model is this something that um you see other corporate housing companies using uh effectively is this something that you could even consider doing yourself uh because you know you have two expectations you have the expectation that you're trying to please for your your you know the demand your 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 businesses and then you have the expectation that you're trying to meet for your uh owners your 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 supply um if you use this master lease model. Um, now it's really just more on the demand side. 
um, with your businesses. Is that something that you see as being a workable model in the corporate housing world or something that you could even do yourself? Yeah, I mean, it's cyclical. I mean, when um, I remember early on, you know, companies would rent uh, an apartment or a couple apartments and just have their staff rotate in and out. Um, and because that was still cheaper than a hotel. And then as people got more efficient, they realized, oh, I, I don't want to just do that. I'll, uh, I'll rent it only as needed. And so then corporate housing companies would, you know, become the economies of scale where they would um, rent out a block of apartments, um, you know, commit to a three or five year term and, uh, you know, rent the furniture and, you know, figure out the furniture side. And, um, you know, if they planned it well, um, could make some money. Um, and then the other you know, then the trend became with technology and efficiencies. It's, it's more of, um, you know, some companies, I, I feel the bigger trend is um, basically on demand. It's like, hey, I need a place for four and a half months in this part of town, uh, this price point, and then they go out and find it, but they only sign on. Their risk is, you know, tied to their client, you know, and at, after four and a half months, their their lease ends two days after their client moves out and you know then it gives them time to move the furniture out um and so you know it's when i see master leases popping up again it's like yeah i mean it works and um it's it's one way i don't know if it'll ever go away and i i also you know you just see these things pop up again and again and you know, at the end of the day, it's kind of like, you know, what, what makes the most sense? How is the company or how is my business structured best um, to, to adapt with the requests of my clients? Do you have any, any opinions or thoughts on the, on the short-term rental uh, model and uh, specifically like that master lease? We, we've, you know, during this time, the short-term rental world has really been impacted, um, you know, vacancies, you know, uh, you know, no vacancies at all, or, or, you know, they're, they're completely vacant. Um, and these people that are using this master lease model at scale, uh, you know, specifically a couple companies like, uh, like let's say Sonder or Lyric, where they rent out full apartment buildings, uh, and they're leasing them. Uh, and now they're struggling with their vacancy. Do you have any thoughts or opinions on, uh, on that? Cause right now everybody's looking at you know, something like you're, what you're doing and you're saying you only have a 7% decrease in, in, you know, occupancy, uh, which is, you know, kind of crazy right now during this time. Uh, but so what, what are your thoughts and opinions on, on this? And by the way, I want to let you know, every day is a new discovery where, you know, Hey, we're doing great. And then three people call and they say, we need to cancel. So, I mean, April has not been great. Um, and it's slow. So, um, I, I, again, that snapshot in time, um, is, is, is accurate, but, you know, we, we thought April was looking good and now April, you know, every day we get, you know, other updates. So it's not a, a waterfall of massive cancellations, but it's, you know, um, it goes up and down. And I mean, we've been signing a couple people too, so it hasn't been just all down, but I just wanted to bring that up that it's not, um, all that bad. So, um, your question, sorry, I got off my tangent again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what, what are your thoughts with these companies? Like, uh, oh, yeah. you, you know, like, um, uh, we work, we work, they, they went under, these companies are dropping everything. All right. It's, sorry, sorry for those that are listening for the for the audio change, but uh, Tim Tim's battery was dying, so we we had to improvise, but we're working. Yeah, I apologize for that. I uh, I thought I had a full battery, but also this, the joys of working from home um, don't have my full equipment uh, with me. So to answer your question, my thought on that model, given a pandemic, which you know, hasn't happened for more than a hundred years now, you know, really doesn't fall on any business plans. Um, you know, so it's a shock to everyone. And, um, 
it's going to leave a lot of people holding the bag because, um, you know, what it, you know, who should pay for this pandemic? Meaning, you know, should the renters suffer? Should the landlords suffer? Should the companies that are guaranteeing the rent suffer? Um, and I don't think there's an easy answer to that. I mean, I know there's a lot of talk about rent forgiveness and, um, help, but, um, I also don't think that, um, I don't think that it means everyone should get a, uh, a free handout or survive. And um, I, as someone who owns a small business, if someone can, I always said, if someone can build a better mousetrap and my company becomes irrelevant, you know, hand my hats off to them and shame on me for not being nimble enough to kind of prepare for that. So I, I know it's, you know, I, I, I'd like to think that if, the whole industry goes away, I'd find something else to do, but maybe work on my jump shot. I don't know. <laughs> and and what, what would you do differently if you had to start from scratch, Tim? I would tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm completely bipolar on technology where we decided to go down and build a custom website and do PHP and programming. And it's the best thing in the world and it's the worst thing in the world. The technology side I'm always afraid of getting stuck into a platform that becomes irrelevant. And so I've spent, i.e. lost a lot of money investing in technology that has delayed uh, rollout, that has led to bad customer service, that has put us behind the eight ball. But I believe that being in control of the technology um, is the right path. And ask me tomorrow and I'll say it's the wrong path. But... If if I could do anything differently, it would be um, trying to have a more long term solution on technology rather than a patchwork and um, the bear. And if you could give one piece of advice to someone who's trying to start uh, a corporate housing company or trying to establish those uh, corporate client relationships, uh, what what would you tell them? Uh, gosh, I'd probably say patience. Um, I mean, like I said, it's a niche. It's not, um, you know, if you have a good property in a good part of town and you do nightly rentals, you're going to keep it rented the majority of the time if it's allowed. And, you know, if everyone's good at it, you know, when you, if you choose to go furnished monthly, you're going to be pulling from a smaller pool of potential renters. Um, the rates won't be as high. The occupancy should be higher. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it's a good path to go down, but it's not going to be high flying like, um, you know, the vacation rentals or the urban, you know, um, hotel alternative rentals. Um, it's just a smaller group. So, you know, and learn from your mistakes. Use that as uh, my other piece of advice is like, you know, do something with it. Don't just get a bad reviews and uh, brush it off, but, you know, act on them. Do you think that short term rentals and, uh, you know, corporate rentals, that there's a, a blend between the two, that there's a world where they can both work together? Or do you think that it's two separate niches and they both kind of have to stay within their lanes if they really want to be able to? Uh, you know, run a profitable business? No, I mean, I, I think being flexible. I mean, I, I think they're similar enough um, that you could make them work. But my advice usually is to choose one or the other and make that a primary um, because, um, I mean, we, I've worked with developers and we've toyed with ideas of, you know, having a, a building where, you know, based on the size and the floor and the features, um, some units would be unfurnished year long, some would be nightly, weekly, and some would be monthly. And I mean, I, I, to me, that makes a lot of sense because it is a neighborhood, it's size, features, you know, each, each one has different needs from closet size to, you know, sunlight access, you know, which, which, do the clients want and then um the hard part on that then is you know marketing it it's like you know how do you describe a building you know you're targeting all different three 
clientele. So, I mean, but back to your original question, I think it is possible to do both. Um, and we just choose to stay in our little world of 30 day rentals and, you know, and and last question, where where do you see corporate housing going in the future? Do you see a change? I mean, you've been there since the beginning, uh, you know, nearly 20 years now, and you've seen, um, you know, the internet, Craigslist, all these different things. Where do you see corporate housing going moving forward? It's always going to be there. I mean, it's all, there's always going to be a need to have something that's larger than a hotel room and um, something that is... Um, uh, dedicated space for longer term stays, uh, projects, um, relocations. Um, it's always exciting to go to the annual conference, the CHIPA Corporate Housing Prior Association, and just kind of see where technology and ideas and, you know, how that impacts and, um, uh, makes the, the offerings better. Um, but I mean, it's, it's it's not going away. It's, it'll it'll always be there, and it's it's a it's a nice little niche. Awesome. Well, th- thank you, thank you so much, Tim, for for taking the time uh, to you know to come on here, share share your wealth of knowledge and experience. Uh, if anybody wanted to be able to reach out, uh, find out more about uh, you know corporate housing or what you do specifically, being in the DC area, well, what's the best way that they can reach you? Uh, I'm pretty good on email. I'm Tim at stayattache dot com. Um, yeah, just go on the website. I can be found on LinkedIn. Um, I've, uh, I've written a couple articles on LinkedIn, sharing my ideas on a couple of these things. So yeah, happy to, like I said, I can talk this stuff all day. So happy to help people out and give advice and see what I can do to uh, be better. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Tim. I'll include uh, everything in the show notes as well as uh, your contact and stay attaché. Um, thank you so much again, Tim. And until next time, Host Nation, keep on hosting. Thanks, man. Take care. Hope you host benefit from the show. If you found value, please go on over to iTunes, leave us a review and let us know what you enjoy about the show. If you'd like to talk to hosts that have been featured in these episodes as well as the community, go on over to our Facebook group, The Host Nation. 